the American deer. Excepting always the elk, wapiti, and reindeer, which have been already described, the deer of North and South America stand quite apart from those of the Old World and are placed in a genus of their own. Usually the tail is long, and the brow tine is always wanting. The most familiar species is the common American deer, of which the Virginian or white-tailed deer is the type. This deer is found in varying forms in both continents and was regularly hunted by the ancient Mexicans with trained pumas. The well-known Virginian deer, found in eastern North America and believed to range as far south as Louisiana, stands a trifle over three feet in height and weighs, clean, about 12 stone 7 pounds. The coloration is chestnut in summer, bluish gray in winter. The antlers are of good size and measure as much as 27 and a half inches in length. As a sporting animal, the white-tailed deer is not popular. Mr. Clive Phillips Wally describes him as an exasperating little beast, possessing every quality which a deer ought not to from the sportsman's point of view. His haunts are river bottoms in choking, blinding bush, and his habits are beastly. No one could ever expect to stalk a whitetail. If you want to get one, you must crawl. Mr. Salis, in 1897, bagged one of these deer somewhat curiously. He was coming, he writes, through the scrubby, rather open bush, straight towards me in a series of great leaps, rising, I think, quite four feet from the ground at every bound. I stood absolutely still, thinking to fire at him just as he jumped the stream and passed me. However, he came so straight to me that had he held his course, he must have jumped onto or over me. But when little more than the width of the stream separated us, when he was certainly not more than ten yards from me, he either saw or winded me, and, without a moment's halt, made a prodigious leap sideways. I fired at him when he was in the air, and I believe quite six feet above the ground. The deer, an old buck with a good head, was afterwards picked up dead. In different parts of America, as far south as Peru and Bolivia, various local races of this deer are to be found. True's deer is a small species, not unlike the Virginian deer, found from South Mexico to Costa Rica. The antlers are in the form of simple spikes directed backwards, and the body coloring is in summer light chestnut, in winter brownish gray. Little is at present known of this species. The mule deer, found in most parts of North America west of the Missouri, as far south as Southern California, stands about three feet three inches at the shoulder and weighs over 17 stone clean. It carries good antlers, measuring as much as 30 inches, and in color is tawny red in summer, brownish gray in winter. It is a far better sporting animal than the sneaking white-tailed deer and affords excellent stalking. These deer are still abundant in many localities. Mr. Phillips Wally writes thus of them in Big Game Shooting, Some idea of the number of these deer in British Columbia may be gathered from the fact that in one district I have had a chance of killing 17 separate stags in an hour's still hunt, whilst one settler in the Similkameen country fed his hogs on deer meat through a whole winter. Four races of mule deer, the typical, the Californian, the La Paz, and the Western Desert race, have been identified by naturalists. The black-tailed deer is another well-known servine of Western North America, closely allied to the mule deer, but distinguished from that species by its inferior size and its much blacker tail. The antlers, as a rule, run somewhat smaller than in the case of the mule deer. This, too, is a very abundant species, affording fairly good sport, considering its liking for timber and dense bush, and excellent venison. In South America are to be found several kinds of marsh deer, of which the best known is the handsome marsh deer having its range from Brazil to the forest country of the Argentine Republic. Little is known of this and other South American deer by British sportsmen, 
The marsh deer is almost equal in size to the red deer of Scotland, but somewhat less stout of build. The coloring is bright chestnut in summer, brown in winter. The coat is long and coarse, as befits a swamp-loving creature. The antlers usually display 10 points and measure in fine specimens as much as 23 or 24 inches. The pompous deer, a species closely allied to the marsh deer, is of small size, standing about 2 feet 6 inches at the shoulder. The antlers, usually three-pointed, measure no more than from 12 to 14 inches in fine specimens. This deer is found from Brazil to northern Patagonia. The Peruvian and Chilean gemals are small deer found on the high Andes and are somewhat inferior in size to the Virginian deer. The males carry simple antlers forming a single fork and measuring about nine inches. The coat, yellowish-brown in hue, is coarse, thick, and brittle. The Chilean gemal is found also in most parts of Patagonia. Unlike its congener of Peru, which delights in altitudes of from 14,000 to 16,000 feet, its habitat lies chiefly in deep valleys, thick forest, and even the adjacent plains, to which it resorts in winter. The brockets, of which seven species are found in South and Central America and Trinidad, are small deer, having spike-like antlers and tufted crowns. The largest is the red brocket, found in Guiana, Brazil, and Paraguay, which stands 27 inches at the shoulder. The body coloring is brownish-red. Like most of the group, this brocket is extremely shy, although fond of dense covert, it is found also on open campos. The pygmy brocket, a tiny dark brown deerlet, less than 19 inches in height, found in central Brazil, is the smallest of these very small deer. Two other diminutive deer, known as pudus, closely allied to the brockets, are found in South America. These are the Chilean and Ecuador pudus, of which the former is no more than 13 and a half inches in height, the latter about 14 or 15 inches. Little is known of the history and life habits of these charming little creatures, one of which, the Chilean species, has occasionally been seen in the Zoological Society's gardens. The Musk Deer This brief account of the deer of the world closes with the musk deer, which differ from almost all others of their kind, the Chinese water deer being the sole exception, in the absence of antlers. In place of these defensive and offensive weapons, Nature has provided the musk deer with long canine tusks projecting downwards from the upper jaw. The musk, from which these curious deer take their name, is secreted during the rutting season, in the male only, in a pouch or gland contained in the skin of the stomach. The well-known Himalayan musk deer is a stout, heavily made deer for its size, measuring 20 inches at the shoulder, about 2 inches higher at the rump, and having a coat of coarse, brittle hair of a dark brown color. This musk deer, which is nowadays by no means common, is found in the forests of the Himalaya, Tibet, Siberia, and western China, often at altitudes of about 8,000 feet. These animals are extraordinary mountaineers, active, daring, and apparently quite unconscious of, or indifferent to, danger. Another species, the Kansu musk deer, found in the province of Kansu, China, has only been discovered within the last 10 years. Concerning this deer, very little is at present known. In general characteristics, it resembles its more familiar congener of the Himalaya. A word should be said upon the subject of the acclimatization of various members of the deer tribe in countries which are distant from their native ground but in which they are found to thrive and breed, some with greater and some with less success. It will be seen that several of the illustrations in this chapter are taken from deer living in natural conditions at Woburn Abbey, the seat of the Duke of Bedford. Others were photographed out of doors in zoological parks or private menageries. 
There is a considerable degree of transferability among deer, not only among those found in temperate or northern regions, but also those which inhabit the tropical jungles of southern India. The Axis, or Chital deer of India, is the most striking example. It lives in the hot jungles where it is the usual food of the tiger, yet it has been transferred to the forests of France and to English parks, and not only lives, but breeds and increases in numbers. It is kept in this country mainly at Woburn Abbey and at Hagerston Castle in Northumberland. In France and Germany, herds of Axis deer have been maintained long enough to observe a curious and noteworthy incident in acclimatization. The Axis deer breeds naturally in October after the Indian rainy season. This habit, if persisted in in Europe, would expose the fawn to the rigors of the French or English winter. Gradually, and after some time, the herds become irregular in the time of reproduction and later produce the fawns in June, at the time which is best suited to their survival. This is a real instance of acclimatization. The Japanese deer, or Sika, was introduced into the park at Powers Court by Viscount Powers Court some 30 years ago. Now it is one of the commonest of recently introduced park deer, both in this country and in France. The venison is excellent and the herds are prolific. The stags are small but very strong, and at Powers Court always get the better of the red deer stags, and sometimes carry off their hinds. Wapiti deer are kept in several English parks, but so far the sambar has proved a failure. Hog deer and Chinese water deer do very well both in England and France. But it is in New Zealand that the best results have been obtained with imported deer. The English red deer, some of which were originally sent out by the Prince Consort, reinforced by some of the same species bred in Australia, have become indigenous. They grow far faster and to a larger size than those on the Scotch moors, and rival the great stags of the Carpathians. The antlers also increase in size at an abnormal rate. Licenses are regularly issued to stalk and shoot these deer, which, like the brown trout and the pheasant, are now among the stock of established wild fauna. Moose and a few sambar stags and herds have also been turned out in New Zealand. The latter are said to be doing well. There is no particular reason why the deer of cold countries should not be interchanged. They seem to have the natural adaptability of oxen. But it is not a little surprising that the species from warm climates should flourish in damp and cold ones. The Axis deer would be a real addition to the fauna of the great European forests if it is found that it survives the winter snows without some form of artificial shelter. No one seems to have considered the advisability of introducing the mule deer into the central European woods. It is a much finer animal than the fallow buck, and the venison is excellent. In those woods where fallow deer are preserved in a wild state, as on many of the German emperor's sporting estates, the mule deer would be a far more ornamental animal. Few people know what immense herds of red and fallow deer, as well as of wild boars, still exist under careful preservation in the forests of the great German, Austrian, and Russian princes and in the royal forests of their respective countries. When the Kaiser holds his great court hunting parties, to which the guests all come dressed in the uniform of the Order of St. Hubert, as many as 200 deer are shot in a day. They are driven past the guns by beaters. After the day's sport is over, all the antlers are wreathed with boughs of spruce fir and the stags laid out like rabbits after an English batu. It is rather surprising that only one species of deer has been entirely domesticated, viz. the reindeer. Deer's meat is as highly prized as that of any other game, perhaps even more so. There is almost no part of the animal which is not useful. The horns are valuable for knife handles and always command a good price. They were prized even by prehistoric man, who converted them into pickaxes and made spearheads and daggers of them. The leather of the hide 
makes the softest and best of all hunting garments. The American Indian or trapper always wears, or used to wear, a deerskin shirt and deerskin leggings made as exquisitely soft as chamois leather by a process known to the squaws. At the present time, all the best gloves are made of doe skin. They are far the most costly of any gloves. Doe skin breeches are also a luxurious garment to ride in. For ornamental rugs, few skins beat those of the dappled deer laid on the floor of some finely furnished hall or room. Thus we have the curious spectacle of the wild men of the far north, the Laps and Ostiacs, taming and keeping in domestication great herds of deer, milking them, using them as beasts of draft, and feeding on their flesh, while far more civilized races in the south have not taken the trouble to do so. The reason is not easy to surmise, unless it be that the idea of making use of the deer tribe solely as beasts of the chase was so rooted in the European ruling races and their kings and nobles that the agriculturist never had a chance of trying to tame and use them for other purposes. It is certain that during the Middle Ages, law and custom made any such attempt quite impossible. The deer were a valuable sporting asset, so hedged round with an atmosphere of feudal privilege that to convert them into something useful to the common people would have been regarded as an insult to the powers that were. End of section 54. Recording by Linda Cantoni.